Next week, if everything goes as expected, Salt Lake City will officially be awarded the 2034 Winter Olympics. This is the end result of many decades of hard work by many, many people who have been passionate about returning the Olympics to Salt Lake City. Uh, also in big part to the staff and managers of the venues from the 2002 Olympics who have kept those places in such good condition that they can be uh, used again for an international event such as the Winter Olympics. To all of you who made it possible, my congratulations and thank you for bringing the Olympics again to Utah. As a civil engineer, the thing that I like most about the Olympics are the new infrastructure projects that get built. In 2002, we famously had two big projects that got funded uh, really quickly and transformed the city from what it had been. Those are, of course, the I-15 reconstruction project and the Trax light rail system. Uh, in the 2002, I was a teenager, still living in Idaho, but I traveled down here often enough to visit family and for other things that I got a chance to view the infrastructure under construction and to feel the excitement in the area. Uh, the Trax light rail network is inspired mainly on Portland's MAX light rail system and also on the San Diego trolley in California. There is a reason why the Sandy light rail stations look exactly the way they do. Now, both of those light rail lines had been built in the 1980s and opened to much fanfare, and that got the planners in Utah thinking about using the former Union Pacific main line through the valley as a transit and light rail corridor from downtown down to Sandy. But in the decade following those openings, very little uh, happened in Utah. For all the meetings, for all the planning, and all the good intentions, nothing was done. No funding arranged, no plans produced, um, no timeline set. In 1993, UTA purchased the right-of-way, but only as a means of corridor preservation, so that uh, they would not lose access to the right-of-way uh, at a future date. But again, after 1993, very little happened, up until June of 1995. And that's when Salt Lake City was officially awarded to the 2002 Winter Olympics. From there, things moved very quickly. By 1997, uh, not only had funding been arranged, but contracts had been signed and construction was underway. Two years after that, in 1999, the first section from the Delta Center in downtown to Sandy opened for the first time. And then, only two years after that, the first spur line from Main Street in downtown up to the stadium at the University of Utah opened for the public. That's a very busy six years. Uh, thankfully, after that, uh, tracks continued to show that it was successful. The public loved it, and the opposition that had kept it stymied uh, and stuck in uh, development for over a decade, uh, all that opposition went away. Trax has since then been extended seven more times, uh, if you count the S-Line streetcar. And uh, it's prompted the construction of a new commuter rail system as well, the Front Runner, which opened to Ogden and Provo in 2008 and 2012, respectively. Tracks and Front Runner together move tens of thousands of people along the Wasatch Front every day, and many, many Utahns depend on it for their livelihoods and for their schooling. It would be hard to imagine life today without them. And without the Olympics, it's easy to see how uh, the opening of Tracks could have been pushed back another 5 or 10, 15 years. Uh, maybe without the original Olympics in 2002, would we still be fighting over uh, a rail line to the airport today? It's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to imagine. Uh, but that's just the power that the Winter Olympics, or any large event like that, can have. Uh, it's hard to be an average citizen or an elected representative who needs to live or, or govern for today, for the moment, but also look ahead to the future. That's doing two things at once, and uh, often the one more immediate becomes more pressing. Uh, the Winter Olympics uh, establish a future date, a hard set date, that we can focus in on and say, at that day, what do we want to present ourselves as to the world? The other big project that was completed before the Olympics is the I-15 reconstruction project that took the original pavement, the original uh, bridges and lane configurations and geometry from the 1960s and completely ripped it out and replaced it with a new, modern, concrete highway system that has needed very little upkeep since then. Uh, the amount of cars that move daily along I-15 is, like I said last time, the 20th most of any freeway in the United States. And where would we be now uh, without that kind of uh, construction uh, happening for the Winter Olympics? 
um, the delays and traffic and road closures caused by that construction were pretty enormous. Uh, one of the worst traffic jams I've been stuck in in my life was for the reconstruction of that freeway. I remember sitting in stalled traffic by the Spaghetti Bowl for I-80, uh, the southern one, and I-15, and uh, traffic had come completely stopped, and uh, we turned off our cars, and everyone got out and wandered around the road and looked at all the new concrete construction, or, or threw balls back and forth uh, to each other. Uh, the 90s were just a different time. Um, and you can see why a project like that would be uh, unpopular among the public, why delays like that would not be tolerated under normal circumstances. But when the Olympics are coming, when the crowds of people and the attention from the world's media are coming, uh, not only construction projects materialize quickly, but so can funding. Uh, the tracks light rail uh, system at that point, those two lines, cost about $500 million, uh, just that for inflation by uh, roughly doubling it, and you get about a billion dollars today. The freeway project typically cost more than the light rail lines, about $1.5 billion in the 1990s, so that would make it uh, $3 billion today. And that $4 billion of funding uh, had not been um, allocated before the Olympics were announced. That only happened afterwards. And even more impressive, about a quarter of that, just a quarter, came from federal sources. All the rest was locally raised, through bonds and through taxes and through other means which just goes to show that uh, the Olympics and uh, large events like that hold a lot of sway for how decisions get made. But of course, there were casualties for this speed as well. Uh, as far as the infrastructure goes, the two biggest casualties, in my opinion, are the two train stations in downtown Salt Lake City, the Union Pacific Depot and the Rio Grande. The railroad tracks that connected both of these depots to the national network uh, were in an inconvenient location and uh, as part of the reconstruction of the freeway viaducts downtown uh, at 600 South, 500 South, and 400 South, uh, those tracks up to the depot were ripped out and uh, completely removed, never replaced. Uh, which means that the train depots uh, have to serve another purpose now. Uh, the Union Pacific Depot is uh, a shopping mall and soon to be a hotel. The Rio Grande Depot uh, used to be state offices, but is now closed awaiting repairs for the uh, 2020 earthquake. And it's uh, kind of sad that that ended up that way. Uh, the Salt Lake City 2002 Winter Olympics doesn't technically have any white elephants left over, that is, structures that go uh, unused but were built for the Olympics, but those two depots, in my opinion, are pretty close candidates. Um, the, the train station in 1999 was moved from the Rio Grande Depot to the temporary station where it is today uh, in uh, 600 west and about 300 south. Uh, I say temporary with a smile because it's been 25 years since that station opened, uh, if you count from next month, and uh, so far nothing has been done to improve it uh, comparatively, not when you're talking about other major infrastructure projects, The uh, say compared to the Salt Lake City Airport, which has been under uh, constant renovation uh, since uh, late uh, last decade. About five billion dollars have been spent to upgrade that airport to international standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's good. It's a gorgeous airport. I love it. It's earned many rewards and it deserves all of them. But compare that to the train station, which again has received comparatively nothing in funding. And uh, you can see there's a problem there. The, the temporary station does not inspire people to want to go there, does not inspire or attract any uh, economic growth or crowds, uh, people just don't like it. If you want to have any funding allocated for rail, we need a better train station. And this isn't to um, complain too much about the decision makers at the time. I've said before that if I had been in their shoes, given the information and the budget and the timeline that they had, I would probably have to make the same decision. Uh, there was a timeline coming up, the Olympics were happening and the depots got uh, lost in the shuffle. But now, in 2024, we have something that those planners did not have, and that's hindsight. I think hindsight uh, is something that's uh, deeply undervalued in the decision-making process for future projects. Uh, you can say that um, you can't know that if a project is successful or not until about 40 years after you build it and see if people are still using it and depending on it. It's been said also that the best time to build something is 20 years ago, the second best time to build something is right now. 
So as we consider what we want to do to prepare our city for the 2034 Olympics, it's important that we look back and see what we should have done back then and try and do something about it now. Other cities have made similar investigations about uh, how to uh, prepare for the Olympics. The first modern Winter Olympics happened in 1994. That's two years after the uh, previous Winter Olympics. Uh, back then, uh, they had been held on the same year as the Summer Olympics, and 1994 is considered the first modern one because that's when they broke it away from the Summer Olympics and uh, had it be its own uh, legitimate sporting event in its own right. In 1994, the Olympics were held in Lillehammer in Norway, and in two, uh, 1998, they were held in Nagano in Japan. Uh, both of those Olympics were highly successful, but they were held in cities that are considered to be you know, outlying regions of their respective metropolitan uh, areas, those being Oslo and Tokyo. That is to say, if you were to travel to those cities, you would get an airplane flight to the regional capital, uh, Tokyo or Oslo, and then if you're headed to Lillehammer, you would board a conventional train. A train service was expanded for the 1994 Olympics, uh, but still conventional trains. And in 1998, for Nagano, they expedited the construction of a new Shinkansen high-speed line uh, so that it would be open for the Olympics crowds. 2002 was the Salt Lake Winter Olympics, and that means that Salt Lake City was the largest urban area to ever be awarded the Winter Olympics as a capital city, which means that if you're traveling to Salt Lake City, you go directly to the Salt Lake City Airport. Uh, and by all accounts, the Salt Lake City Games were a success, not just in terms of an event being pulled off, but in terms of public perception as well. And they helped establish the legitimacy of Winter Olympics as being their own international event. Uh, since then, um, many larger cities than Salt Lake City have been awarded the Winter Olympics, and countries such as Russia and China have used the Olympics to be national showcases of their culture and uh, economic status on the world stage. The Olympics themselves have also grown uh, much beyond what they were in Salt Lake City. By 2034, the number of events uh, held are going to be a lot more than they were in 2002, nearly double, uh, I believe. And uh, the amount of ticket sales for the events are no longer counted in the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions, uh, generally, for each Olympics. Uh, the number of athletes competing and people in the press corps attending has also increased. The, the TV rights and advertising deals have gone from being uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to being multi-billion dollar deals all on their own, just to prove how much attention is being spent on these events. Uh, it's not just the uh, amount of attendance received as well. The cost of hosting the Olympics has gone up uh, dramatically, and some of that can be attributed to uh, overspending by certain governments. Russia and China are the most famous ones because they spent uh, many dozens of billions of dollars on their versions of the Winter Olympics in Sochi and in Beijing. Uh, both of them needed new rail lines to connect not only to the airports nearby, but also up to the uh, sports venues high up in the mountains. China is famous for not building only a high-speed rail line up to the new sporting venues, but an underground high-speed rail line that is also fully automated. An automated underground high-speed rail. <laughs> Hard to beat that. But uh, other cities have been spending big on Olympics as well. Pyongyang in South Korea uh, had a planned high-speed rail line to it that was expedited for the Olympics in, in their city. And uh, that, of course, uh, cost many billions of dollars to construct. Uh, Vancouver, which hosted in 2010, they built a new uh, automated light metro line from their downtown to their airport that cost about two billion Canadian dollars. It's not listed in the cost of their Olympics because it wasn't a requirement in the bid package they submitted, unlike uh, Russia and China. But it is something that they planned on having open to uh, deal with the crowds. Now, Salt Lake City, we have our own airport transit line now. Ours cost about uh, $350 million, which is uh, peanuts compared to what Vancouver paid for theirs. And I only compare Vancouver because it's about the same size as Salt Lake City. Obviously, Vancouver has a much higher density in their downtown than Salt Lake City. I mean, they're the, the fourth densest city in all of North America. But in terms of commercial statistical area, our population in Salt Lake City is slightly higher than Vancouver's and the uh, amount of passenger traffic to our airport uh, is slightly higher than Vancouver's as well. Um, and obviously theirs is farther away, which would increase the cost. Their downtown is an airport or farther apart. But at the same time, 
uh, spending $2 billion versus $350 million just goes to show that we in Salt Lake City are not used to the costs of what a modern Olympics uh, generally require. Now, of course, there's been criticism of the higher costs. Uh, there's been so much uh, criticism of uh, one and done sporting venues and other infrastructure projects that literally just uh, get abandoned and crumble away into the, into the forest after the Olympics are done. Uh, there's been so much criticism of this that uh, there have been serious talks made of turning the Olympics into a permanent rotation system of designating one or two cities per continent um, to be permanent hosts with a guarantee that the Olympics would come back to the city every 20-ish years. Sorry, my camera overheated in the sun. These permanent host cities would be guaranteed to host about every 20 years. So you'd have two cities in Asia, maybe two cities in Europe, and one or two cities in North America as well, depending on um, many factors. And these permanent host cities would be able to keep their infrastructure uh, in good condition so that they could be used again. And Salt Lake City is uh, well positioned to earn this status of permanent host. Obviously we have our venues already and we have a climate that is going to stay cold at least as long as the Olympics are projected to continue. And of course our biggest asset is the people in Utah who have greatly supported the Olympics with uh, uh, popular support uh, much higher than other uh, prospective host cities. Uh, we really do love being the center of attention here in Utah. We take ourselves uh, very seriously. But that's not to say that it's all guaranteed, far from it. Because the Winter Olympics bring in many billions of dollars of benefits to their host cities and regions, uh, you can expect that many other cities are going to want to compete for these dollars. Now, what does this mean exactly? Well, we can imagine um, uh, things are going to be graded on the same level. What improvements in infrastructure have we made? Well, uh, by 2029, the Front Runner Forward project should be finished, which means that instead of 25 round trips per day, our commuter rail system will have about 50 round trips per day. And instead of carrying about 15 to 17,000 daily passengers, which is now and before COVID, uh, that will about double to being in the 30,000 passenger range. That's about the same number of commuter rail passengers uh, using Front Runner as currently use the entire Los Angeles commuter rail network, uh, last time I checked. That would make Front Runner one of the most distinguished commuter rail lines uh, or regional transit lines in the United States, which is good, but the trouble is, due to the decisions made before the last Olympics to remove the railroad tracks from the established railroad stations, we do not have a central station that can handle that kind of passenger loads. Now, you imagine a Winter Olympics or other world event coming into town at the same time, adding many more thousands of potential passengers to the rail network, then you're going to have a real problem. Imagine uh, what happens when an Olympics happen and uh, visitors are spread up and down the Wasatch Front in hotels or rentals in many different cities uh, where the events are going to be taking place. And they want to come downtown to see the events here. And it's winter and it's cold and everyone's crowded on the platform. And then due to the winter crowds, uh, or due to the crowds, uh, there's an accident. Let's say someone is hit or, or even killed by a train as it comes through downtown at one of the railroad crossings or uh, at one of the pedestrian crosswalks to get to one of the very crowded platforms uh, uh, for the commuter rail system. And can you imagine the service disruption and the crowds of thousands of people piling up on the um, uh, on the bare platforms uh, without any kind of passenger amenities waiting for the system to be restored. And then imagine the social media cameras pointed at all the, all the carnage, all the, all the delays while it happens. And think about what that does to the reputation of Salt Lake City and our ability to host future Olympics. But now imagine instead if we decide to build the Rio Grande plan and we have as a station amenity the beautiful and historic Rio Grande Depot, able to accommodate all kinds of passengers headed to many locations up and down the Wasatch Front and throughout Utah. Imagine having no more railroad crossings downtown so that accidents wouldn't even happen in the first place. These are the kinds of infrastructure projects that people count on and expect if we're going to become a world-class city capable of hosting world-class events. So I'm going to say what I've been saying for the last four years. Let's build the Rio Grande plan. Let's build something 
that better represents our cultural values as Utahns. Let's re-establish the railroad station to where it was before the last Winter Olympics moved it away. Let's remove the railroad crossings and let's eliminate all the deaths and delays and injuries that those railroad crossings cause. Let's build something that shows that we are both ambitious and fiscally responsible. Let's build something that shows that we are a community that values sustainability, walkability, livability, connectivity. Let's build something that connects not only our past to our present, but our present to the future. The Rio Grande Plan is not just a project for one Olympics. It's not even a project for many Olympics. The Rio Grande Plan is the potential for us to define our community in the way that we want to live in it. If you like that future and you want to be a part of it, well, go to our website, read about the Rio Grande Plan, join our conversations on our Discord server or other social media platforms. Uh, link the Rio Grande Plan to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers and neighbors. Let them know that you support it. Most importantly, let your elected representatives, both locally and at the state level, know that you personally support the Rio Grande Plan and want to see it built. If all these actions sound like small things, maybe drops in a bucket, well don't you worry. I can guarantee you that we are building a flood of support. I'd love for you to be a part of it. I'm Christian Linhart. Thank you for watching.